We're going to get started. Um, welcome everyone to the launch of Decisionscape by Elspeth Kirkman. It is an absolute pleasure uh, to be on the stage with Elspeth tonight launching her fantastic book um, and I hope we're going to have a fantastic conversation. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. So we have no fire drills planned tonight, but in the event of an emergency, those of you in the room, uh, you can exit through the main entrance which you came in through. Um, and for those of you joining online, thank you very much for joining. Um, there is a, a part of the platform where you can put questions in, and when we come to the Q&A, we'll take questions from the audience in the room, but also from people online as well. Um, so I'm Liz Costa, I'm the Managing Director of the Behavioural Insights team, um, but tonight is really about Elspeth Kirkman. Um, and her fantastic book. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce Elspeth before we get into our conversation. So Elspeth is the Chief Programs Officer at Nesta, uh, where she oversees Nesta's three missions and is really trying to drive incredibly ambitious impact across early years, uh, net zero and emissions reductions, and also halving obesity as well. So, you know, really impressive missions and Elspeth is bringing a very wide and diverse toolkit to those. Um, before Elspeth joined Nesta, uh, she was a senior member of the Behavioural Insights team, uh, where she set up our North America office and led our work across social policy. Um, and this is Elspeth's second book. Um, her first book was co-authored with Michael Hallsworth and it's called Behavioural Insights. Uh, that was published in 2020 uh, and also a fantastic read. Um, so alongside that official bio, um, I'm genuinely delighted to be here tonight because Elspeth has also been a wonderful friend of mine for almost a decade. She's the only person I know who decided it was a wonderful idea to write a book on maternity leave and, and actually followed through on that <laughs> and, um, you know, was never bored during that time. Um, she's also one of the most intellectually curious people I know um, and, you know, the way Elspeth's mind works really surprises and delights me on a daily basis and I thought before we started I might read you kind of some of the some of the, the, dis <laughs> the disparate things that uh, Elspeth sends on WhatsApp on a weekly <laughs> basis, just to give you a sense of, of how she makes connections and, uh, you know, innovates on a whole range of, of different topics. Uh, so this is just from the last week. So um, <laughs> about a week sure ago, I to <laughs> you definitely did it. Um, about a week ago, we got a message. So for ages, I've been thinking about, and bear with me, setting up something like a pop culture or gossip magazine to promote heat pumps. <laughs> and the great thing about Elspeth is that she doesn't just put this out as, you know, a casual thought. What follows 30 seconds later is the link to the substack that she's made for Heat Pump magazine and its first article called Royal Flush, The Princess and Her Unlikely Consort, uh, which is there promoting, you know, the glamour of heat pumps. Um, here's another one. So this is a, a bar chart, so a bit of empirical work, and it's titled Distribution of the Top 30 Most Cited Bible Passages by Quintal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's accompanied by the message, I'm not saying people don't actually read the Bible properly, but I am saying they cite the early parts of its books more than the other bits. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, uh, like our WhatsApp chats, Decisionscape is really a tour de force of a whole breadth of different areas of, uh, you know, art history, social science, behavioural science, but also pop culture as well. It's hugely relatable. It brings together a whole range of different topics and ideas into a really coherent framework about how we make decisions and how we can make better decisions. Uh, so with that, you know, we're all in for a treat. Uh, let's dive in. Elspeth, tell us about the book and let's start with what is a decision escape? Yeah, great question. I kind of wish you would answer it because you're so much more coherent <laughs> on it than I am. Not sure. um, so a decision escape is, the book is basically about um, how we form our perspectives, uh, how those pers pers perspectives kind of um, get distorted and what that means in terms of our judgments and, and decision making. Um, and I'm basically a huge fan of finding a metaphor and then just torturing it until no one wants to hear the metaphor anymore. <laughs> and so the decisionscape is, is the tortured metaphor here. 
Um, so it's kind of premised around this idea that if you try and borrow from the world of art, um, you can learn quite a lot when it comes to decision making. So when an artist is, you know, setting about kind of planning their canvas and uh, figuring out how they're going to create a kind of um, really good representation of, uh, of, of the world around them, there's a few things that they do really, really deliberately that we don't do deliberately in decision making. So they think about where attention is drawn. They think about um, uh, how things are sized relative to each other to kind of show um, uh, to show whether they're kind of distant or not. Um, uh, they think about the overall kind of composition, etc. And so the book kind of explores these different dimensions of um, how an artist creates a canvas and applies them to decision making and tries to find sort of perhaps unlikely, perhaps slightly tortured, but um, parallels and lessons between them. I don't think it's tortured at all. It's, it's a beautiful metaphor, and particularly when you think about it as a as a canvas and think about yourself as the artist of your own life. Um, do you want to tell us about how you landed on art as the catalyst and the organising idea? And perhaps you can take us through, you open the book with, you know, really quite a thrilling history of how linear perspective is developed over centuries and, you know, why it doesn't really take hold until the Renaissance. I want to talk about why that sort of catapulted you into the decisionscape. Yeah, I kind of came to it quite late, actually. So I'd written most of the book with a completely different um, metaphor in mind, which I won't get into because it doesn't actually hold up to scrutiny. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think it was a little bit of a kind of... I, I don't even really remember. I was listening to something completely different about the history of art and about this sort of surprising reality that I, I didn't really know very much about it. And I thought, you know, I'd seen kind of Roman <clears throat> pictures, for example, where they're, you know, showing a, a painting of a street or a villa or something... And because I don't have a very well-trained eye, I'd assumed that they'd nailed perspective and that they'd kind of got it exactly right and they had the vanishing point and they had all the parallel lines. And then I was listening to something and it was saying, no, actually, we really didn't figure this out until the Italian Renaissance. And despite the fact that we've been creating art for, you know, basically ever since humans have, uh, Homo sapiens has been around um, and we've been trying to use art as a way to replicate the world around us, um, it took us you know thousands of years to land on what is actually something quite simple that an eight-year-old could uh, could fairly successfully sort of uh, replicate now if you if you taught them and I just kind of yeah I think it sort of sat there for a while and didn't really make the connection and then it was as I was writing the rest of the book and then I was thinking oh you know what a lot of this is about it's about the same things it's about the fact that um we don't intuitively, uh, you know, artists don't intuitively create perspective. It's an incredibly deliberate geometric process where they have mm -hmm. to kind of learn these these rules um, uh, in order to, to kind of accomplish it. And when we're making decisions, it's it's a similar thing where we don't <clears throat> we don't have this kind of perfect code of if something's happening far in the future, we sort of minimize it and we say, yeah, yeah, it's on the horizon line, so we don't need to worry about mm -hmm. it today. But we don't do it in a way that's rational and in a way that's proportionate. We'll sort of go, oh, that's happening tomorrow, just like chuck it all the way out there and don't don't pay any attention to it. Yeah. So I, I think the parallels sort of emerge there. And you also talk quite early on about how perspective is is subjective and you know we think of things like even linear perspective as as an objective and fixed idea um but you talk about how it is in fact a, a social construct in lots of ways and do you want to talk about the um the difference between eastern and, and western perspective yeah this is like i mean this is something perhaps everybody else knows this it sort of blew my mind a little bit um so we think of you know we think of perspective and just to be clear when i'm talking about perspective in art i'm talking about um, the illusion of depth, so creating uh, an illusion of depth that makes it look like you're actually kind of, you know, looking at a world in three dimensions. Um, and as I say, we sort of got to the Italian Renaissance and uh, it was, you know, figured out how to do this and codified and the printing press was invented around the same time and it took off and it kind of exploded and suddenly everyone everywhere was doing it. Um, except in massive parts of the world where they weren't. Uh, so China, for example, um, Chinese artists were not using linear perspective. And the sort of, uh, you know, very naive kind of take on this was, have they not read these books that we've produced? And it's like, no, it's not that. It's not a lack of understanding. It's that in um, Chinese and Eastern art at the time, they were using a system called parallel projection, which kind of came up um, uh, around the same time. And parallel projection is just a different way of showing perspective. But what it does is it allows you to see, it's used in engineering drawings a lot today, um, but it allows you to see much more than any individual person would ever be able to see. So it gives you what you would call like a super realistic kind of um, uh, view of the world. 
And you suddenly realize when you understand that, that you think <clears throat> linear perspective is this objective, hard, rational truth that just shows you this is what the world looks like, but it's actually uh, a cultural product. It's recreating a lot of the obsession with rationalism, uh, a lot of the kind of individualistic um, focus uh, with, uh, you know, in, in what, in Western societies at the time, and um, parallel projection is is doing a similar thing, but with a more Eastern perspective on things. So it's saying, what if the purpose of art was to give all of us a viewpoint that was greater than any individual could possibly see? And so I just sort of really liked that as a way of getting into this, these things that we think are natural and objective and, uh, you know, intuitive in some way are actually cultural products that that say a lot about who we are and how we how we see the world. There was quite a nice kind of link back to behavioural science as well and, you know, that central tenet of behavioural science being that the environment around us shapes our decisions so much more than than we're aware of as individuals. And so right from the beginning it was interesting to see you kind of take those threads of behavioural science and extend them and and talk about them from, I guess, more on an artistic perspective. Um, Do you want to talk us through the pillars of the decision scape? Yeah, okay, this is where I get to torture the metaphor, isn't it? Go um, for it. <laughs> so, yeah, so the decision scape is, um, is, is the mental version of the artist's canvas. And there are kind of four parallels that I try and draw between uh, art and between our decision making. So I've already talked about the first. So that's this idea of distance and diminution. So when an artist is um, creating the illusion of depth, the main thing that you'll notice they're doing is they're sizing, you know, small thing far away, uh, big thing up close. Um, and again, I, I sort of already alluded to it, but psychological distance is a really big feature of our decision making. So if uh, we, we treat things differently, depending on if it relates to a person that we know well or that we don't know well, if it's something that's happening right now or if it's something that's happening in three years, um, if it's like a, a pretty likely thing, whether the sort of hypothetical chance of it occurring is high versus if it's a sort of outside outside chance. And so that's the sort of first pillar of it. The second is... Um, Viewpoint. So when an artist is creating a picture, they're sort of obsessively thinking about how should somebody view this? Where should they be standing? There'll be an optimal place for, for you to stand, the way you hang the painting, etc. cetera, is uh, you know, designed so that it's at most people's uh, sort of average eye level. Um, and that sort of relates back to the idea that when we make decisions, we're seeing the world as we are, not as, not as it is. And so everything we do is colored by um, this kind of, uh, you know, everything about us, our identity and uh, the lenses that we're looking at the world through. Then the third bit is about composition. Um, so an artist will obviously think about how the whole um, piece hangs together. Um, and so you might look at a very specific detailed part of, of the picture and it sort of um, doesn't quite cohere with the entire whole of the picture and that will be a deliberate choice on the part of the artist. And that part of the book is really about how when we make decisions, we're often having to toggle between the sort of big picture and the sort of details that that make it up. And sometimes we make make mistakes when we do that because um, sometimes the details are are kind of different to some of their their parts. And so you think you've made a good decision, you zoom out. And so, I mean, we've all done this in work, right? Where you're like, great, you know, we've like got all the details nailed. Let's just zoom out and try and make sense of it. And then you think, well, this is an absolute Frankenstein of a decision. What have we done here? Um, so that, that's what that part is about. And then the last piece you already kind of referenced, so that's, that's the idea of the frame. So an artist is choosing, sometimes consciously, probably sometimes non-consciously, um, what, they, what they focus on, who the subject is, what they're including, what's within the kind of um, bounds of their painting or, or picture or whatever it might be. Uh, and our attention is like that, our decisions are like that as well, where the choices we make will be bounded in ways that we do and don't understand. So we might say, I've already deliberately limited the choice set that I'm operating within. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I know that that's the kind of realm that I'm dealing with. But there might be all kind of cultural, all kinds of cultural forces, like the idea that it's pretty hard for us to instinctively see that perspective is a cultural product, for example. There might be all kinds of things that are just, you know, that's just the water we swim in and so we don't, don't notice it. Do you think there's there's bits that loom larger than others? Like when you think about the decision scape as a framework, are there bits that you think are more important? Yeah, I think, so originally I just thought the book was going to be about psychological distance mm. um, and then it sort of spawned a little bit and I think that's why the, the metaphor suddenly started working. But I think that really is the kind of big one. If we can, you know, we we all can think of, I assume, tons of examples of times where we've made what in hindsight was not a great decision because we were emotional, because 
uh, we were worried about offending somebody because all sorts of other things and those things you can just think of as like they're looming so large and they're so in the foreground that they just blot out everything else and it's the only thing that your attention can be drawn to. Mm. And if we could uh, deploy techniques to enable us to say, yes, the emotion is making that loom really large, but if mm. I was being deliberate about this, it would actually be a kind of middle distance thing, mm. mid-sized. It's not where the attention is meant to be drawn. It's relevant, but it's not, it's not determinant. And I mean, people do talk about it in a kind of pop psychology sense of I need to get some distance from this situation or relationship or whatever it might be. But what I really love about what you do in the book is, is you break down what does that actually mean and, and what are the different elements of, of psychological distance. And I guess one that I hadn't really thought a lot about before was linguistic distance and, and how language can either kind of be used to, to distance ourselves from a situation or a or a decision, or it can be used to make it very proximate. Um, and I mean, you tell wonderful stories through the whole book, uh, but I think a really nice one is about Prince Frederick, who was prince in Prussia, um, and he, you know, conducted really quite a twisted experiment around... Not a what, nice guy. Not a nice guy, <laughs> yeah, uh, around what would happen if children were not spoken to and, like, how that would... Uh, harm their their development and actually as I was reading it I was realizing I think we've spoken about this before but there, there's this book that I read when I was a child and the Australians in the room might recognize it as a Paul Jennings book I believe and um, I, it must have been inspired by this because the story is that there's this child he's, he's actually a teenager in the story but his parents have taught him the wrong terms for everything so it's like this is a chair uh, you know, this is a field. Um, and then they let him watch an hour of television every day to see if that reverses it, and it doesn't. And, and it's a very sad and twisted story that ends really awfully. <laughs> anyway. Much like the Frederick one. Much like <laughs> Frederick. Um, all to say, language really dramatically shapes our experience of the world. It dramatically shapes our behaviour. Yeah, I loved writing this bit of the book. So my uh, background before, uh, long before I was a behavioural scientist, is I did a, a literature degree and so I'm big into my close readings and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I think I actually really had to curb myself in on this one a little bit where I just desperately wanted it to be true that, you know, if you speak Russian, you're going to have a completely different worldview than if you speak English just because the languages are different and nothing to do with anything else. Not true. Yeah. Don't think there's good evidence for this at all. Um, I know, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of evidence, maybe. But, um, and, and actually, there is a really good, so there's a paper that some people will be familiar with about um, mm. the use of future focused languages and how that changes your um, behaviors that are future focused. So, behaviors that are future focused are things like uh, saving for retirement or um, being able to sort of uh, more effectively exercise self control around things like smoking. Um, and there was this hypothesis in this very popular paper that was released that showed that languages that uh, differentiate better between the future and the present um, have different kind of future focused behavior uh, rates than those that than those that don't um, and there were these linguists that read this paper and were basically like what a load of bullshit like you can't <laughs> separate language from culture this is obviously nonsense and what's pretty cool is that they contacted um the first author of the paper and basically said that and he was like cool let's rerun it with your models that help us to you know make sure that we're not conflating culture and language and so they were like okay and they collaborated and they did it and um they reduced the effect size quite dramatically but they couldn't get rid of it it still seemed like there actually was some some relationship between these things and the linguists were were kind of very surprised and uh, thought it was super interesting um, but that aside, most of the the bit on language is about how we use uh, how we use language to kind of um, present the world differently, and what the effect is of that mm. on, on decisions we make. So things like uh, how the passive voice is used in court. Uh, I, I do a bit of a analysis of the um, opening statement in the George Floyd trial, yeah. um, where uh, the defense Derek Chauvin's defense lawyer is kind of. Um, giving a basically a master class and lawyers using the passive voice to remove his defendant from the narrative and to put all mm. of the focus on George Floyd and on everybody yeah. else you know everybody except from the, the the defendant and it's just a very interesting um it is kind of an interesting way to to look at something that that doesn't necessarily seem bound up in language and decision making 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've uh, spent all the years since my law degree trying to not speak in the passive voice, including I have a zombie test, which is uh, <laughs> for those in the room who also struggle with the passive voice. Uh, if you add by zombies to the end of any sentence and it makes sense, it's passive and you should rewrite it. <laughs> um, so I end up spending a lot of time thinking about zombies. So the, um, the original chapter title was going to be the passive bit voice was used by zombies. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I mean, I was privileged to, to see pieces of the book and the research sitting behind it as you were writing. And I think one of the uh, the funniest and sort of most shocking parts of it was when you sent me a, a three-page list of euphemisms for genitalia and uh, I don't know what I'm doing with my time but I've <laughs> never seen a lot of those words before. <laughs> um, but tell us about euphemisms and particularly, you know, how you brought this to life in the book and, um, and, and I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous but it actually really, really matters for women's health, for uh, a whole range of other things. Yeah, so I got kind of um, hung up on this for various reasons. I've got two, <laughs> I've got two young daughters, and it, it's sort of I think it's a phenomenon that lots of parents find where you, you're suddenly kind of thinking, "Am I meant to just use a euphemism, or can I just tell them what this body part's called?" And I found myself in a Google rabbit hole, and I found this forum um, where someone—I mean, you can't believe what people on the internet do, can you? Someone had gone on this forum and been like so excited just had my 20 week scan unfortunately it's a girl and now I need to think about what I'm going to call her you know and rather than being like that is absolutely unhinged what are you talking about just enjoy yourself <laughs> people on the internet are like don't worry I've got you covered and there's like a list of like 50 things that people will say rather than saying vulva it's absolutely wild <laughs> but um so it's got a good chat that just opens with like, you know, foof, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> lots of different, lots of different things. Point being, as Liz said, <laughs> that this stuff does actually matter um, because if people can't uh, describe a body part properly, then they can't talk to a doctor effectively. They feel shame. They, you know, um, can't report uh, inappropriate conduct or whatever it might be. Um, so that's the kind of in, and then it talks a lot about the cultural use of euphemism, the fact it's always been around, it exists in basically every culture, it's something that we use to kind of soften the blow on a lot of things that we don't want to talk about, we don't know how to talk about, um, and it's kind of one degree removed from silence on a on a topic, and it was, yeah, it was really fascinating to, to research and kind of took me from, yeah, Franz Kafka to a internet forum about euphemisms for genitalia let's talk about that let's talk about your <laughs> research process because because you do cover you know an incredible breadth and variety of examples that span you know the very highbrow to the quite lowbrow tell us how quite. <laughs> quite, <laughs> tell us how you how you sifted through them I just think the word process is quite generous when you say research <laughs> process. Um, I did, I mean, you said, you know, as you said, I wrote the book when I was on maternity leave. And so I was spending a lot of time just trudging around listening to podcasts with my brain kind of half working with the baby, I should say. I wasn't just, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with my brain sort of in that weird like hinterland between sleep and, uh, and not sleep. And so I think I was doing a lot of um, connecting things that aren't obviously uh, or even non-obviously connected. So a lot of the research process was probably um, not a deliberate, oh, you know, I'm going to go and do a systematic review of all of the articles on, on this mm. particular topic and more of a, I'm generally thinking about this thing mm. and then listening to something about like dog breeding in the 18th century. And it's like, obviously that is an exact <laughs> parallel. What, what didn't make the book? What, what's, what's, what's on the cutting room floor? More than you might expect. Um, yeah, what was my favourite bit? I actually had a whole bit on the post office scandal, which I didn't realise was going to be quite a zeitgeisty as it was, yeah, yeah. and I cut it because I thought it was boring. Um, ah. So who knew? Um, yeah, there was that, and then there was a whole... Um, there, was a, there was a section where I'd gone very, I'd gone very, very deep on, like, the, the geography of... Um, Montenegro and I don't know why <laughs> it was I can't remember but it's maybe for a travel book <laughs> the next one yeah um so you go through these four pillars of the decisionscape and and set out you know how it can help us to make better decisions in our lives what do you think are the main takeaways for people reading the book in terms of what are the practical tools to 
get better perspective. Yeah, people always ask this, and I think, come on, I've written a book, don't ask me to also make it relevant. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, you and I both do a lot of work with um, with governments and with um, businesses and at an org- kind of organisational level. I think it's probably a really, um, bit of an overstatement to say really useful, I think there are applications um, for organisations. So I think if you thought about organisational decision-making through these lenses and you were to map out... Um, you know, to map out what an organisational decision scape looks mm. like and you were to say, these are the things that we say we value, that we prioritise, that we're solving for. These are the things that we actually, you know, kind of um, mm. uh, find distorting our decisions, kind of um, drawing the eye away, uh, et cetera. You would probably find that you could, uh, you know, fairly easily identify some of the things that are distorting forces and then um, kind of design around them. So as you said, a lot of the... Um, you know, one of the messages I'd really want to sort of uh, be taken away in anything to do with behavioural science is you're going to have much more luck changing the environment or the process than you are the person. So meet people where they're at, design for them, um, and try and kind of build a world that optimises for, you know, that helps us optimise for whatever we want to do in our best moment rather than sort of, you know, assuming that a bit more education, for example, is going to is going to change people. And so... Um, uh, so I think it's a useful, you know, it's, it's then useful if you've done that kind of designing of the decision yeah. scape to then say, and what are the infrastructural things? What are the kind of processes in place? What are the policies that we have? What are the behaviours? What's the culture? Why are we kind of yeah. uh, finding all of this? Did did it change the way you make decisions? And oh, of course not. It's entirely things. hypocritical. <laughs> 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 no, don't listen to me on decisions. Um, and I mean, on the... So that's the organisational. What about the personal? And, you know, for the people in the room, how would you recommend that they, I guess, craft their own decision scape and where should they focus within it? Yeah, I think some of it is maybe about giving a language to things that we all recognise and creating a little bit of a kind of mental shortcut where in a moment where you are making a decision, you can almost sort of checklist what's looming large for me, what's in the foreground. Uh, If I sort of, you know, I mean, there's, you know, particularly with things like temporal distance, some of the very uh, classic sort of probably unevidenced tests, like how are you going to feel about this in six months are incredibly Mm -hmm. helpful. So, you know, if you think Mm -hmm. about the decision scape now where it's all up in your face and you think about it in six months time and it's Mm -hmm. sort of over here and it turns out those are two very different things, you shouldn't be making a decision right now that's just trying to placate, you know, and get rid of whatever that that uncomfortable big looming thing is um some of the stuff I thought was most interesting was in the composition section so around this interplay between the big picture and the sort of detail um and I think that there are tons of decisions where it is really easy to just get super particularly when we get stressed we sort of tunnel right so you'll be like this is a solvable detail this is the thing that I'm really going to kind of obsess over this is the thing that I'm going to dedicate all my attention to and then you either realize that good you've solved that but the house is still on fire or whatever it might be or you solve that and the solution for that becomes the thing that you then kind of say good and we can apply that to everything else without really thinking about you know it doesn't Mm. actually kind of the the transition doesn't work I mean how much do you think we can do on our own because I mean you say you haven't changed your own decision making which I'm not sure I believe you entirely but you've definitely changed mine and you know, whenever I need to make a big decision, my WhatsApp with Elspeth is my first port of call and she'll send me a list of questions <laughs> for my future self, <laughs> which are very helpful. And, you know, it is that that sense that of... spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it is that sense of, you know, project forward. How do you feel talking to somebody about this? Like, do you feel proud of it? Do you feel embarrassed by it? Are you, like, do you feel full of regret? Um, yeah. I've, I've lost the question in there. No, but. I think it was. Um, can you do it yourself? Like, can you oh, do it yeah, yourself? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think you can? Do you think it's realistic that people can have enough, I guess, self awareness and perspective on their own lives, or do you think it's something that actually, you know, the people around you can bring to your relationships? Yeah, I think. I mean, one of the most powerful things you can do when you're stuck in a psychological distance trap is to recruit somebody that you know mm. and you trust and you know is interested in your interests Mm. and say here's the situation what would you do because they're going to tell you that you're worrying about the wrong things so completely agree and I think also the idea that um like anything accountability is is really useful so it may be that you can sit down and say right if I map out what I want in my life what I value what I think is important what I want to prioritize 
um, this is what it looks like and that's your sort of ideal decision scape. Mm. Then having somebody that is your kind of accountability body and can say, mm. you realise that that's not what it looks like at all in reality and this is where it's deviated and you're saying that you care about, you know, family should be the big thing in the foreground and actually you're constantly at work or like whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, I think it is helpful to have somebody else to to hold you to account. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so what's your favourite part of the book? Like what do you, if you had to ask everybody to open up to a page now, where We've would you take them? We've talked about the, uh, the genitalia chapter. So. <laughs> <We have. laughs> um, do go to that bit though. <laughs> um, I think... There's a bit I found really, I don't know that this, you know, I think you've already said a good, a good thing about it. Well, you didn't say it was a good thing. You just mentioned it. So maybe you don't know. I don't think it's a good thing. But the dotting around and the sort of jumping um, means there's yeah. something for everyone in this book. Um, I think one of the things I really enjoyed was looking into research on kind of pattern recognition. So again, on that composition part, on the big picture, we're pretty good at, uh, you know, anyone who's interested in behavioral science will know this. Our brains are basically just amazing at pattern recognition. So they're like that looks like archetypally this kind of problem, I'll solve it with this rule. Um, And usually that serves us really, really well because they're very good pattern recognition engines, but sometimes the pattern doesn't exist or it's not quite the right fit. And so, you know, things like conspiracy, everything from a conspiracy theory to like, you know, slightly applying the wrong rule of thumb uh, can kind of fall into this camp. And I got really into um, all of these different things where um, the kind of the whole and the detail look different. And my favourite was... I watched this video, I can't even tell you how many times I watched this video, it's of a crowd singing Bohemian Rhapsody um, in Hyde Park. Uh, mm. that, I think they're waiting for Green Day to come on stage and the tannoy starts playing like a really crappy version of Bohemian Rhapsody. And the crowd starts singing, you instantly can't hear the tannoy, it's, it's so loud. And they're just perfect, it sounds mm. absolutely amazing. And I was like, how, I, I mean... If I said to anyone, if I just said, you've got to stand up and sing Bohemian Rhapsody now, maybe you've got an amazing voice, but like, it's a very hard song for anybody to nail. Mm. Um, But somehow a crowd uh, is much better than the sum of its parts. And when you sort of look into it, it makes complete sense because it's like, you'll have a small number of very good singers who can carry the entire song. You'll have lots of people who are good enough that they can sing one section in their range, but they'll be Mm. sort of dotted between, you know, the highs and the lows and whatever. You'll have... Lots of people who will just bottle it when they cut in, just be quiet when they can't hit a note. And then you'll have loads of super confident people who just like barrel on through and it's wrong. But the thing about being wrong is there's only one way to be right when you're singing, but there are many, many ways to be wrong. And so if you've got many people being wrong in lots of different ways, they just cancel each other out. It's just noise. <laughs> and then all you can hear is the is the melody going through it. And um, I just thought it was a really nice example of how you can have, you know, if you took any individual piece of it, it would be a disaster and you take the coherent whole and it's, it's this lovely, quite beautiful thing. I mean, I hope that makes it to the audiobook version. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like it needs to be embedded in there. <laughs> Um, so final question for me before we open it up to online and in the room. Um, so, I mean, you're an empiricist at heart. Were there, you know, did you go through the book thinking there's some amazing experiments that I'd love to run on perspective? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, and also I just want to hear your answer on this as well. Um, you first. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a chapter I've got on um, what I call sort of temporal uh, landmarks I think other people call them that as well but um in my sort of decision scape it's like these uh you know these these temporal things um and basically how a lot of our decisions big and small are influenced by the way that we measure and count and adhere to to time so things like governments spend money differently at the start of a financial year at the end of a financial year mm-hmm. there's this like amazing graph only to people like me, of marathon finish times. And you would expect it to just be like a really smooth bell curve. And instead it's like, um, and those are like the two, like it's half marathon actually. Those are like the two hour finish mark, the two hours, 30 minutes. And it's because, and they're not races with pacemakers or anything. It's because people are so obsessed with round numbers that they'll be like, I'm going to finish in two hours. And you get all these people that could have finished in an hour and 52. But they were like, God damn it, if I'm not training for two hours. (laughs) Uh, And probably all these people who really should have finished in two hours and five who are very injured at the finish line. So you get this, you know, complete inefficiency. And it's just a silly example of this, this way that we're quite seduced. I mean, you think about the lifts at work on the hour when you're trying to go between meetings. It's like, what are we all doing? 
Like, why are we all having meetings on the hour? It's, mm. it's, it's absurd. Um, but we're completely seduced by it and we think it's a sort of natural, natural thing. And so I think particularly on things like government spending, you know, a pound at the start of the year is worth a very different amount to a pound at the end of the year. It would be quite interesting to try and experiment with what if you could create these kind of temporal landmarks at different points in the year to smooth yeah. out spending and then would it have an effect on, you know, outcomes and... Mm, that's interesting. Oh, I like that one. Mine, I think mine was also on the temporal distance point and you talk about, you know, some of the Zimbardo studies and uh, the idea that people are obsessed with just the present moment and, and their place in the present moment not just in the day, but kind of in, in a point in history. And there's a, there's a lot of literature around present bias and hyperbolic discounting and interesting studies about things like, you know, what does it look like if you um, ask somebody to imagine themselves as an old person or even show them kind of a, a doctored picture of themselves at 80 and then you ask them to make decisions about their pension contributions and they're quite different. But I wonder what it would look like if you extended that kind of way out yeah. and, and you looked not just like you're making decisions for yourself in 20 years, but you're making decisions for generations to come and, and it's about being a good ancestor. So particularly in spaces like climate change, like how far out can we realistically span people's <laughs> sense of, yeah. of obligation, I guess, and, and time. We should run those experiments. We should just, yeah, we should just run experiments for a living. That's those. what we should do. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. I'm going to open it up for questions uh, in the room and then online. Do you put them in the chat um, and we'll, we'll have Izzy will read them out as well. Yes, please. Um, uh, we have a microphone so that people online can hear you. Hello. Given what you just said about pension saving, because sadly I know too much about that, there's a piece of research that says if you ask people if they live, how long they'll think they'll live to, or when they think they die by, um, is very different estimation. That's mm. like nine years or something as yeah. it's replicated. Um, so from the book, how would you frame your questions differently as well now to others and to yourself? Yeah, I'd probably just open every conversation with when do you think you're going to die by? <laughs> <laughs> or why aren't you dead yet? <laughs> um, no, I think it's a really good I think it's a really good question. There's lots of examples in in the behavioral science literature of like the same question asked a different way produces a completely different answer, right? So I think maybe that's also a kind of dimension of it on the um, you know, why is something uh, why is something looming large for you? And you know, as we talked about before, there's linguistic distance is is one piece of that and I suppose the framing of a question is is an aspect of linguistic distance so something is suddenly like shunted much more up in your face just by the way that it's it's expressed um so yeah I think if you're trying to you know can use it for for good or for evil when influencing other people's decisions but also when you're thinking about um decisions yourself thinking about both the way that the question is articulated and also the frame on the question so like what's the question excluding by making you focus on um you know a particular thing maybe you want to like you don't want to save for retirement you want to put all your money on red and just like you know mm. hope for the best uh and and unfortunately pensions agencies don't advocate that so <laughs> <laughs> true maybe they should <laughs> um other questions in the room yeah got the oh, so we'll just wait for the microphone so people online can hear you i just wondered how you'd respond if i changed the title your your kind of subtext how thinking like a disruptive artist can improve our decision making. How would you respond to that? I didn't actually get any control over the subtitle, so you can take it up with the publisher, <laughs> but I personally like it. Yeah. Second edition. Um, what, what I'm talking about is, is history of art. It's littered with people that have changed direction through very singular thinking and very personal thinking. And, um, for me, they're the most exciting moments in, in our art and not necessarily the kind of mechanics of the Renaissance, you know, which is, you, you talk about the empirical view, you know, and, and I just think that decision-making inspired by um, the, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, or, or the, you know, the, the um, troublemaker is really what takes you on a journey that you could never imagine. I mean, I, I really hate... Um, 
working in kind of brainstorming fashion. I really, I think it redu is reductive and it comes down to some kind of collective, um, you know, brownness, you know, somehow. And, and, you know, people that I love, people's work, people like Kubrick or, you know, the Eames in architecture, you know, those people that have just broken the rules, architects making film, nobody could tell Kubrick how to make a movie and that's why the movies were so wonderful, you know, and Joseph Boyce and you go on and on and, and uh, you know, that's, for me, that's the excitement of, of trying to learn from, from the world of artists. Yeah, and I think actually, I, I mean, I don't, dis I don't disagree, and I think maybe it's a sort of of its time thing, because when um, Brunelleschi first figured out linear perspective, that was incredibly disruptive. It was very radical. It was totally unprecedented, and it sort of set the world on fire in this like quite significant way um, that took off you know, very, very quickly. So I think it is a story of innovation and, and disruption. It's just something that today we're like, yeah, I mean, that's just how you do how you do art, isn't it? And I think the example I gave earlier of the um, uh, the use of parallel projection in China as a way to sort of, you know, as an, as an in to thinking about, well, actually, perspective is a cultural product. You can also uh, take the same lesson from a lot of kind of modernists, for example. It's, you know, they're all sort of questioning and pushing at the boundaries. And the, the, the part of the book... The last part of the book that's about the frame, what's included, what isn't, um, I think is trying to get at that, that aspect of disruption a little bit. Like, what are we not imagining? What have we got blinkers on? What are we kind of just doing because we've been told to do it? And what if you could just kind of expand that frame a little bit? How, how could you design the world differently as a result? It's quite hopeful too, isn't it, that, you know, it's possible for artists to radically shift their style just like it's possible for people to radically shift their perspective and, and their decision scape as well yeah. uh next question yes hillary no it's fine i think it's just because online it works for online i think oh okay Ooh. can i turn it off Anyway, I'm Hilary Sutcliffe from Society Inside. I'm doing some work on addiction um, and the addiction economy. And I have this little model where addiction is a little bit about biology. It's a little bit about psychology. It's a little bit about social. And I've developed a, an, an economic model on top of that. And so I was quite excited and interested by what you said about don't bother changing the person, change the environment. But, you know. So what we're looking to do is something on vapes. And I wanted to know from your perspective now with this new, this different perspective on decision making, you know, we're looking to help young people make different decisions about using vapes and not. And all the stuff out there is just really shocking given the fact that there's so much behavioral science there. I just wondered what observations you have about individuals and decision making, but also about how from an outside point of view, we help them make different decisions without doing it in a patronizing and stupid way. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge question and it's incredibly, yeah, it's incredibly relevant to lots of different areas. I think, um, yeah, my sort of hot take on it is something like vapes is very interesting from this perspective because um, it's not even clear, I think, what the prevailing are they good or not message is. So from the perspective of if smoking didn't exist and suddenly we invented vapes, obviously not great. In a world where smoking exists and the cessation, smoking cessation rates when you're uh, using an e-cigarette or vape are so much better than, and it's, I may be kind of misquote, you know, misquoting orders of magnitude or whatever, but so much better than other other kind of quitting methods. They're really good, but we have the, you would disagree. We have this, um, but we have this mental model, which is, you know, Quitting means not doing it at all, and so any version of any version of smoking is bad, and a vape is a version of smoking. And so I think that people, and, and by the way, I'm talking about adults smoking and clinical interventions to stop them doing it. I'm not talking about teenagers um, uh, kind of picking up picking up vapes. Um, so I just think it must be incredibly confusing if you're trying to quit smoking and people are going, "Well, you know, vapes aren't great either," and being able to differentiate between the risk of continuing smoking and the risk of switching to something like vaping is it should be really easy for people to understand what the health consequences of those two things are and to be able to pick the harm reduction approach. And I just really don't think it is. So I think there's an obligation um, probably in public health to kind of say, we don't need to be alarmist. We don't need to be um, sort of puritanical in a, uh, you know, any version of the behavior is is bad 
we can't lie and we can't say, no, these things are completely safe or, or whatever it might be. But we do need to make sure that people understand that there are sort of orders of magnitude of difference between the potential harms of these, these products. Um, that would be my take, but I'd love to chat about it after. Um, do we have any online? Yeah. Yeah, if, if we could bring the microphone down to the front. Thank you. Yeah, so I've got a question from Elizabeth online kind of around the skill set of artists and how can we be bringing that artistic training into intervention design? Oh, I like that. Great question. Yeah. Um, I suppose there's, um, there's two aspects that I try and pull out in the book. One is creativity and one is deliberateness. De yeah, being, being deliberate. I'm not sure you would necessarily think of those two things as uh, obvious sort of bedfellows but but the whole kind of premise of the metaphor is that we're um, we're making these decisions in a sort of non-conscious way when we're kind of you know accidentally paying way too much attention to the thing that's uh, looming large in our face um, whereas an artist would very deliberately be choosing where things are and then representing it in a way that was crystal clear as to to where it ought to be so I, th I think that kind of like deliberate sort of planning an execution process and iterating and going back and saying it didn't quite work how do I sort of do it again and not being precious about that um I think is one thing that I would sort of pull through into intervention design so can we kind of you know break it into smaller pieces can we test test the small parts independently can we see how they cohere together can we you know rather than saying I've done the whole thing and that's it fixed um and then the other piece is the creativity part so actually to the point on sort of um disruption you know it might be that we're saying well this is the paradigm within which we're creating this intervention this is the um uh so i realize you didn't ask the question i'm just addressing all the answers to you <laughs> um uh yeah this is the paradigm within which we created the intervention uh in the first place and so that's what we're kind of iterating on but being able also to look and to say what if it wasn't what if the things that we're taking as constraints weren't real things and we could sort of challenge them and do stuff do stuff differently so i think those are maybe the two things any other ones online at the moment? Or should we go to another one in the room? We haven't had any from this side of the room. Anybody like to ask a question? Lucy. Thank you. Let's say there was widespread adoption of the kind of lens you've used throughout the book and there was much kind of greater standardization of the decision-making sort of tools and processes for thinking. Um, do you think you would get more kind of consistency in decision-making across the population? Um, and would that be a good thing if that were to happen? Ooh. I kind of just want you to pontificate a bit on the answer because it's such an interesting <laughs> question. You must have thoughts on it. Um, do I think there'd be more consistency? In it? I sort of think one of the things I quite like about this book that I have written myself is that... Um, <laughs> it's quite personalized so it's not supposed to be a rubric for like this is how people should make decisions it's supposed to be a this is how you can understand what's important to you and therefore how you should make decisions off of the back of that and you know it's definitely flawed in that as Liz said I'm a bit of an empiricist and so they'll be kind of like and you can assign weights to things or whatever it might be but it should I would imagine that if people were much more deliberate you know you can't be deliberate in every single decision you make all of the time but if they were more deliberate in some of the bigger decisions then you would see more diversity in the things that people were choosing for themselves so if you think about something like um deciding how much money you need to live the lifestyle that you want a lot of people are just making money to buy things to impress people they don't like like uh, you know that's the, that's the kind of you, you, th you think about or oh, if I downsized or if I got a less well-paid job or whatever it might be and you think about what the feelings are underpinning that and obviously there are real financial reasons and all those things but sometimes it is just these people might care and then you think how much do you like those people oh like not very much so I just wonder whether if people were more deliberate in in those kinds of decisions whether you might see a bit more you know more people opting out of like I'm going to mortgage myself up to the hilt or you know again I realize that's a you know real privileged thing to say and then yeah I don't think consistent more consistency would be a good thing I think people people making decisions that align with their values and what they want would be a good thing and I would imagine that would create more diversity yeah, maybe you're unleashing courage and decision making as well by people understanding more about what their own perspective is and, and how to make decisions in line with it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's I'm unleashing courage, actually. You are unleashing courage. 
Um, other questions? We've got time for maybe one more. Yes, on the front. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if there was anything in gender and decision making, because um, there's quite a lot of females in the room today. And I just thought that obviously this has landed quite well with us in terms of an event. And um, women go through many processes in making decisions that maybe men shortcut. So Yeah, mm. yeah that's really interesting. Um, that is really interesting. So I think, I mean, I think there's lots of gender uh, angles on it. So the viewpoint section that's sort of talking about, yeah, I kind of shorthanded it earlier as we see the world as we are, um, rather than the world as it is. A lot of that is about identity, you know, who you are, who you believe you are, who other people believe you are, how the world treats you, um, all of those things. I don't necessarily kind of pull out gender specifically, but I do talk a little bit about how, um, you know, we're shaped by um we're shaped by all kinds of different things, including including uh, including gender, including race, um, including other demographic features. Um, yeah, and I do wonder. It would be really interesting to compare. You know, if in if Lisa's utopia comes to to being, where everybody is now decision scaping their life. Um, sounds like a wax, though, doesn't it? When I say it like that. Um, <laughs> then it would be really interesting to compare and contrast and see are there, are there actually different things systematically between between women and men and what's explaining that. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question. I don't have a good answer. Maybe you need a manscape as well. As <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to wrap us up there. <laughs> Elspeth, it's an incredible achievement. It's, um, it's such a fresh take on perspective and I hope that you all buy the book. Please go and buy the book. Um, it's insightful, it's incredibly entertaining and enjoyable to read. I think it's also really practical as a tool for making better decisions in your own life. So I'm so proud of you. I think it's wonderful. Happy book launch. Um, Thank you for doing this, Liz. And uh, please, everybody in the room, join us for a drink afterwards. For those of you online, thank you so much for joining and I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, and we'll leave it there. Thank you. Hello. <laughs>